We're now joined by Ro from The Hiking Physio. Thanks for joining us today, Ro. Hey, Anna. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm really looking forward to the event and um, supporting your participants. It's a great cause. And we're excited to have you on board. So tell us a little bit about how you came up with the name The Hiking Physio. Well, the name can be taken pretty literally, actually, because um, I've been both hiking and a physio for about 30 years. Um, but the main um, message of the name is that it's intended to convey to hikers that um, this is a dedicated physiotherapy service for them and that it is a service that is actually um, for hikers that's run by hikers um, who are actually physios. <laughs> So the perfect place for all our participants to be coming and getting information and learning from. And if they need some help before they hit challenge day, I think you're the person to hit up. Let's begin with some of your top tips for preparing your body for an endurance event. Look, um, one of the big things is, is, you know, is and it's an important part of this particular challenge is putting in the training is where the magic actually really kind of happens because it's the training that really helps to prepare your body. And that's um, a really critical thing because if you don't do the training and then you go from zero to 100, of course, human bodies don't like change all that much. So um, that's where you're going to find that people will get really sore because their bodies are just not ready to deal with it. Um, it's also really important because the training provides the opportunity to test yourself as well as your gear um, and to get everything dialed in. Um, it allows you to see what you're capable of and um, work out if there's anything that's not kind of working. And it also gives you the opportunity to build some strength and mobility. Um, this is something that a lot of walkers often, um, you know, don't kind of take into account. It's very um, profound thought that, you know, just to improve hiking, you just need to do more hiking. Um, but the problem with that is, is that obviously doing too much of any one thing can lead to overuse injuries. So doing some um, strengthening work to support your joints and to help you get over any of those obstacles and power you up the hills and everything, um, as well as some mobility work so that you, you know, can stretch and move well is also really important. We have lots of our 30K participants who almost dismiss the distance that they're walking using terms like I'm only doing the 30 kilometres or I'm just doing the short course. In our perspective, there's no such thing as a short course when we're talking 30 kilometres, but what's your thoughts on someone who's going to walk 30 kilometres in a day? Look, you know, 30 kilometres is a substantial different distance to walk and it's something that most people will never do in their lifetime. So, you know, it shouldn't be underrated. Um, you know, it's a distance that will take many hours to do on the day and many hours of putting in the training. And my thought is, is that, you know, those hours that you're putting into training and those hours that you're putting into the event are an investment in yourself and they're an investment in your team. And those efforts should absolutely be celebrated. Um, you know, look, there are probably a few people who can show up and walk 30 kilometres without, um, you know, doing much training and get away with it. But that's not really the spirit of what this whole event's about. It's really more about, you know, having that opportunity to invest in your health, make have have time with your friends and, um, yeah, really make some some changes that could turn into some excellent lasting habits for you. Excellent. We couldn't we couldn't agree with you more, right? That's exactly what the Great Aussie Hike is all about. So it yeah. sounds like you're saying preparation is pretty important to a successful challenge day experience. One of our participants commented in a Facebook group recently that she's completing the 30 kilometers, but she's training for a 35 kilometer walk so that she enjoys her journey on the day. Would you recommend this type of thinking or use the adrenaline and energy of the day to help you walk the longest distance you've ever done? Look, a lot of it really comes down to how much time you've got available, Anna. Not everyone has heaps of time in their life, so um, it also depends on how much time you've got leading up to the event. So um, when you do something like actually um, covering more distance than what you're going to have to do in an event, it's a principle that we call overload. 
And that essentially means that you do that level of training so that on the day you actually can enjoy yourself and you have that extra bit of confidence because you know you've done it before and you're fine. And if you have someone who's got the amount of time that they can do that and they can build up gradually and still have enough time before the race so that the last couple of weeks are um, you know, able to include a bit of rest and, and allow them to be nice and fresh and ready for the event, it's a great way to go um, because it is, you know, it is going to help their health and their fitness and their confidence. However, um, that's not necessarily practical for everyone. Um, so it's also good to know that for the average person, um, if they complete most of the training and they're pretty consistent and they can do a distance that is, you know, typically at least about 75% of the distance of the event, um, they're, they're in pretty decent shape. If they can't do that 75%, well, it might be a little bit more of a struggle, but even 75%, 75K is is a lot. Um but anyone doing the 100K should be trying to do that over two days, not obviously in one day anyway. So um, that makes it a little easier. What the share the distance so they can come off and have a little rest for a section two, which is handy. Um, yeah, totally. I think for people who, you know, we do get some people who are a bit worried coming in and going, I don't think I've prepared enough. Um, as mm. long as, as you've said, that's a really good benchmark to go, have you prepared 75%? Because mm. the energy and the spirit of the day and all the people cheering you on and everything like that will lift you that that extra little bit as well. Yeah, look, 100%. And um, look, there are some things that you can do that can make um, it a little bit easier to complete that, you know, full distance on the day if you haven't done it before. And I'm sure you're going to probably ask me some questions about those. So I might have to snake in some of those little tips a bit later. Save, save, save some of your goodies for later. So yeah. All our participants are hopefully, we very much hope, training pretty hard at the moment and getting lots of kilometres on their legs. How do they avoid um, an injury in the lead up to the challenge? <laughs> Look, honestly, one of the, well, there's a couple of things that that often happen. Um, number one is people do kind of a bit of a panic and they go, oh, I haven't done anything. And then they start doing these big efforts, you know, like they've gone from maybe walking 15K and they think, oh, look, I'm going to be doing this, you know, 50K. I need to go out and do a 25K. Um, that's kind of the wrong way to go um, because your body doesn't really like to go from one extreme to another. So where possible, being a bit more consistent and building up your distances gradually um, can go a long way to helping um, helping you out. Um, those small consistent efforts are just so much better for you and so much more effective than than really you know big grandiose efforts. Um, things also like making sure that you're training with your equipment, um, you know, really paying attention to what you're doing and how your body's feeling. Um, because obviously, um, you know, if you're not paying attention to what you're doing, one of the biggest problems that I see over and over again, and oh, true confessions, I've done it myself, that um, when you go to grab something, you stop paying attention to whatever is directly in front of you. And um, yeah, if you, you know, if you're going to actually have to grab something or make an adjustment or take clothing off, it's better to actually speak up and and you know, ask your teammates, hey, look, I just need to stop for a sec, just grab something because multitasking is one of the number one um, things that happens that causes people to fall. So if you can, um, obviously, it's much better to just stop rather than trying to do that multitasking on the on the trail. So, you know, we all look pretty funny turtled, but we'd really rather not get injured. <laughs> and if, um, you'd, you'd, you'd hate your challenge day experience to be stopped at a stop. Well, look, you know, honestly, um, injuries happen and um, it's one of those things that, you know, you have to sort of deal with. But at the same time, there are things that you can do to try and prevent it, obviously, some of the things that we've mentioned. But, um, you know, other than um, avoiding multitasking, the other big one um, that people, you know, don't always um, do is making sure that if there is a problem and they notice that there's a problem, actually addressing it. Um, because when you've got your pack on and you haven't got all your gear dialed in and everything else, you know, you might have to stop to take your pack off to get your drink of water. And um, so people don't necessarily want to do that. But if you don't have enough food and you're not drinking, 
um, you're going to eventually run out of energy and not feel that good. So when you, when you, you know, when that happens, obviously get more tired and when you're more tired, you're more likely to fall. So um, yeah, it's always important. That's the other one is, is just to make sure that you pay attention to how you feel as well as the track. Um, And if there's a problem, like you're feeling tired, thirsty, you know, sore or whatever, address it as quickly as possible. And again, it's not a timed race event that there's no second and third. It's about getting you to the finish line. So you do have time to take a couple of minutes to look after yourself. Oh, 100%. And look, it's important to remember that that you're there to enjoy it. Um, you know, unfortunately, um, some people, well, I should say it's not unfortunate, but different people have different ideas about what they want um, an event to look like and, and how they want to hike. Um, some people love to just hike fast because it makes them feel good and they like to push and challenge themselves. And, and that's totally fine. But in an event like this, where you're doing it with the team, it's actually important to take the time to talk to your team and see how everyone's doing and, you know, really enjoy the day because you put in a lot of training and effort to get to here and you know you want to take photos of each other and be silly and wear your best outfit and have fun because that's what it's all really about uh, and we love the teams that dress up and then go just take that best outfit to the next oh 100 percent. love the pink tutus in some of your photos they're, they're rippers uh, and we always say you're only as fast as your slowest team member hundred percent. But um, look, some people just don't like to go slow. And the main thing that I'd say in regard to that is, look, it's okay to spread out a little bit. Like if you've got um, someone who's quite a bit faster and they're happy to just walk at their pace and then, you know, go ahead a bit and then wait for others to catch up, that's fine. But don't leave one person at the back. That's the main thing is, is just always make sure that um, the last person in your team can see the person ahead of them because that way, you know, you can check in with each other and make sure they're all right. Um, and that's what we talk about is like that 100Ks, you know, enough to be able to yell. Mm. And if, oh, sorry, not 100Ks, 100 metres. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 100 metres is, is about as far as you can go in the bush so that you can yell, you can ask for help, you can see what's going on. And most importantly, um, for our safety requirements, you need to be 100 metres within the whoever's carrying the team tracker. So that mm. we, can, we can keep an eye and we're tracking you the whole way and, and worrying about your safety. Getting back to preparing and potential injuries or people just a bit worried about is their body up to it, is there anything you can do to help people prepare with the services you offer? Look, the- 100%. If um, One of the great things about the hiking physio um, is obviously it's a dedicated physiotherapy service for hikers. So um I have just actually finished the Overland track and understand completely what it means to get sore feet and get a sore back and um, all the things that go along with that. I also know all the tricks and tips to make your hiking more efficient. Um, So the big thing to be aware of is um, if you're really worried about managing the day, um, you're welcome to do a consult and even just chat to me, have a chat to me. Like if you've got a sore knee, how am I going to manage my knee on the day? And we can use, you know, your consultation to go over exactly how you're going to do that and what that's going to look like and what you need to do and how you need to treat it afterwards. Um, We can use consultations to talk about anything from, um, I'm really not sure if I'm using my hiking poles right. Um, Can you show me how to do that? Or or um, it can be a case of, oh, well, I've kind of got a bit of a mild ankle sprain. Um, do you think it's okay if I actually do do this track? Or, you know, can you show me some taping techniques to, to help get me through it? So there's a lot of different things that um, that I can do, as well as um, the fact that with the training that you've got, it, it's fabulous. You've got a great, great outline of training. But sometimes training that's very generic doesn't work for some people. So for example, with some of the strength exercises that you've got, some of those might irritate some people's knees, for example, or maybe they've got a dodgy hip or a sore foot. Um, So what I can also do is um, have a chat to participants who are maybe feeling like they should be doing the strengthening, but finding that every time they do it, they get sore. So we can fine tune their particular program to match, better match their needs so that they can still do the strengthening that they need or maybe more specific strengthening and actually help get them on the right track. So they're really well prepared. Individualize it so it's perfect for them and their body and their needs and the distance. Exactly. Thing like that and I think then that also helps people feel so much more confident and they've had the discussion and they're um not as nervous going out on course which you know that's a big part of it is the mental mental side of going for a big walk as well 
Ah, uh, look, you know, as I said, having just come back from doing the overland over six days, literally a week and a half ago, um, I get the mental side of it. Um, obviously, the overland track is a bit of a different undertaking, but um, it's the same idea. You know, you've got a big event that you've been looking forward to for months and it's exciting and you've been putting in all this work or maybe you haven't. Um, and, um, you know, it's, um, it, you know, it can be quite daunting. So, um the, and, and the biggest thing that I'd say in regard to that um, is if you get to the last two weeks um, before the event, please don't try and throw in a whole bunch of training then because the most important thing that you can do in the two weeks before the event is just make sure you've got all your gear ready, have a, a bit of a rest, feel like you, you know, you're nice and fresh for the event because getting yourself really tired in the last two weeks before the event is really um, not a good idea. <laughs> Definitely not. And yeah, you don't, especially if you're panicking, you haven't trained enough, just come on the day because we can always get you off course. You can have a little rest, come back and on and join your teammates. There's no issues with those kind of things. That's much better than actually getting yourself to the point you can't get to the start line. A hundred percent. And look, that's the other thing is, is that if someone is really worried, you know, they've got an injury and they're, they're just not sure if they could, should continue training or whatever. There's so many tricks and tips that like, you know, like if you've got an Achilles injury, there's ways to manage that. For example, if you've got a knee injury, you know, you can use taping and bracing and um, hiking poles and all kinds of stuff. There's ways to manage a lot of injuries. So. So I think get into contact with you, get things sorted out, get a plan is the way to go. Now, that's if they're finding these hot spots and issues during training. What about if they start feeling some pain when they're out on course? How should they manage that? Look, the single most important thing is actually to um, do something about it because a lot of people will get sore and then they just don't want to, they don't want to stop. They want to keep going. So blisters are one of the most common things that happen. Um, they're just so incredibly common. So um, one of the things that I, I suggest is um, if the participants can carry like just a, a small um, foam mat or a, a plastic bag or something so that if they need to sit down and it happens to be wet on the day, they can sit somewhere dry um, because if it's going to be wet and they don't have anything, they won't sit down. Um, of course, you know, you can wait until you get to the wellness stop, but sometimes that's a bit too long. Um, I should mention too that a yoga mat, just the Kmart kind, cut up into, you know, a few pieces so that you can spread the pieces out amongst your team. That yoga mats make great um, little sit mats if necessary. Okay, um, we have at the wellness stops and they're also just so light as well for them to be able to attach to Yeah, them. yeah. So, um, you know, if you if you've got a hot spot like a blister, carry blister care on you. Um, my favorite, to be honest, is hiker's wool because I find that I can just tuck it in my socks. It's pretty quick and easy. And even if my socks are a bit wet, um, it seems to do the job. Um, or if you know you're prone to blisters, obviously prevention is is one of the best things. So if you know that you're going to have a problem, um, try and prepare ahead. But once you're actually on the track and you're doing it, um, then if, you know, you can certainly stop on the way, but absolutely make use of the wellness stops because, um, you know, there's lots of great stuff there. There's obviously going to be your first aid stuff if you need anything. Um, you know, there's there's some mats there and you can do some stretching and things, um, you know, and have a drink, have a brief rest and, and so forth. Um, you know, you can use some physio cream if you're a bit sore. Um, the biggest thing that I'd say with all injuries is the sooner that you address them, the easier they are to address. And, um, you know, when that's on trail, obviously hot spots and blisters and, and, and chafe is a big one too. So carrying some glide balm or some pawpaw cream or any of those kind of that's that's also really important. And and the big thing is, is in the time in the lead up to the hike, um, you know, if you've got really sharp, severe or, or, you know, significant pain, particularly anything that lasts more than two weeks, and you know that you've got this event coming up, get in touch, you know, get some, get some help because, um, we want you to have, uh, we want you to enjoy your training and have a great, have a great event. Like, you know, you don't want it to be torture. <laughs> Tell us about gear now. So you've said lots about having the right gear. What is the right gear? Look, um, the main things that I'd say for an event like this, obviously there's going to be lots of beginners. And the number one thing is to make sure that you've got comfortable footwear that fits properly and you um, have the right kind of socks um, because cotton should be absolutely avoided. Um, in fact, ideally not having any cotton gear, having quick, quick dry gear for all your gear is a good idea. 
Um, the reason my cotton, particularly with socks, is bad is just because it doesn't dry quick enough and it holds moisture against your skin and that makes your skin more susceptible to chafe and to blisters. Um, and also, you know, if you're wearing a cotton T-shirt, for example, um, it doesn't dry quick enough and if it gets cool, you're going you're gonna to end up getting cold. So um, good footwear and, and socks. And a big thing that a lot of people make a mistake of in terms of footwear is getting footwear that's a bit too small. And I use the expression footwear because I could get into a multiple hour debate about the benefits of boots versus shoes. Um, ultimately, the, the short answer to that is whatever works best for you. But the um, number one thing that I would say about footwear is just be aware that your size in your um, hiking footwear will likely be at least one to two sizes bigger than your regular shoes. And the best way, one of the best ways to check and see if it's going to be right for you so that you can avoid black toenails, which again, I've had, wow. um, you know, even I've done it. Um, is to make sure that when the shoe or boot is unlaced and you slide your foot forward so that your toes just touch the inside of the, the shoe is you should be able to get one or two fingers down behind the back of your heel so that you know that if um, you're going downhill, you've got a little bit of extra room for your toes. And then obviously making sure that your, your shoes are laced, um, that's important. Um, and then, you know, just the common sense stuff, things like dressing for the weather. Ideally, you should have some kind of decent rain jacket because it's pretty miserable if you don't have a decent rain jacket and it rains the entire event. Hopefully it won't, fingers crossed. Um, yeah. But talking about gear, we often get questions about whether people should be using hiking poles. They're like, you're not going up a mountain and they, they I guess they they think about hiking poles as transversing a, a large, well-known mount somewhere in the world. What's your recommendation? Look, you know, ultimately it comes down to the individual. For an event like this, um, particularly the longer events, it can be helpful to use hiking poles. Um, the main sort of things that are the consideration are, you know, like um, you're going to be on pretty uneven terrain and so hiking poles can help with your balance. Um, the other place where hiking poles really come into their own is if you've got um, – if well, if you've undercooked your training a bit, <laughs> um, which you know, again, um, hiking poles are really good for using your arms to help propel you uphill. So, if you know that your leg strength is just a little bit, you know, maybe not quite good enough, um, using your arms to help can be really good. The other place that they're useful is if you know that you're carrying an injury, if you know you've got a bit of a sore foot or a sore knee, um, hiking poles particularly helpful for going downhill to help with um, managing soreness in your knees and things. So, um, look, uh, I love my hiking poles and I wouldn't do a multi-day hike where I'm carrying a big pack without them. But um, for a day hike, it really does come down to personal preference. Um, the sort of people who perhaps shouldn't use hiking poles would be people who know that they just trip over their own feet um, <laughs> um the other thing is is that sometimes there are some places where you can't use hiking poles because it's a bit too bushy or, or whatever so um the main thing that i'd say is if you're someone who is carrying a bit of a lower extremity injury in particular or knees or hips or feet um, or if you know that your leg strength isn't great, maybe consider trying some hiking poles, see if you like them, see if they feel helpful. Um, I believe I gave you a video about how to use them, but um, I'm not sure if anyone's... On social media, but yeah. people can... Yeah, cool. So, um, yeah, so, so certainly they're worth a try. Um, just something to keep in mind, though, two things. Number one, if you think you're going to use them for the event, you do want to spend some of your time training with them because... Um, when you're using your arms, um, you're actually carrying the weight of the poles and you can get quite tired in your arms. So it's also good if you think that you're going to be using poles to consider um, just checking to see if there's a way that you can attach them to your backpack if you don't want to use them the whole time or if you get a bit of a sore shoulder um, because sometimes that can happen. Sometimes your hands can get a little bit sore. So um, definitely make sure that if you're going to use them on a particular on the 100K um, that you've got a way to stow them if you don't want to be using them the whole time. And then the other thing is... Um, if you are planning on using poles, it's really good to do some training without them because obviously they help you balance, but the whole point of training is to prepare your body for what you're going to put 
put it through. So if you've got the option of um, doing a bit of training without them, then, you know, you're going to have to use a bit more strength. You're going to have to use a bit more balance. Um, and then if you do that, you also won't panic if you realize that you left them in your best friend's car um, on the day of the event and that they're not there when you actually need them. So good idea. Um, if you're going to train, if you're going to use them, train with them most of the time, but not all of the time. Um, and yeah, see what, see what works for you. So before we wrap up, do you have any top tips or tricks for our walkers? Look, I think I've covered probably most of these, but I'll just quickly run through a few. <laughs> Number one, yeah, just a bit of a checklist. Pay attention. Number one, pay attention because um, it's when you're not paying attention that you'll step on the snake or you'll end up in that divot and um, that's when things go wrong. And if you're paying attention, that also means to how you're feeling and making sure that, um, you know, if you're starting to feel thirsty or tired or hot or whatever, that you um, then are aware of it. Um, that then means that you should address what's, whatever's going on. So, you know, if you're hungry, eat something. And as a general rule of thumb, um, you should be having small sips of water often and having a, a snack of some kind at least every hour. Make sure that you speak up and you communicate with your team. Really, really important. You're all there to, to enjoy the day. And, um, you know, the worst thing ever is for one person to feel like, oh, you're, you're speeding off and they're getting exhausted and tired and then they have a terrible event. So, yeah, speak up to, to let your team know if you need a rest or if you need support or whatever. And speak up to the coordinators and the people the wellness stops and me if you need some help because um we're all all there to make sure that you're going to have a great event um big one is just to make sure that you pace yourself to have the best possible chance of being able to get through the entire event to feel good to enjoy it and to not pull up super sore afterwards you want to generally as a rule be moving at a pace where you can breathe through your nose and you can hold a conversation and that's even true on the hills small hills for some people are still big hills um, and oftentimes you know you'll be doing some hills in your training as well so um, yeah, again, just take, just, just enjoy them and take them gradually. Perfect excuse. If you don't want to say, I'm really struggling is to say, Hey, I just need to take a photo. That's an amazing view. Sometimes <laughs> taking a little bit smaller steps on your uphills and downhills, just particularly if your knees are a little bit sore, um, particularly on the downhills, when you take a little bit smaller steps, it just doesn't put as much load through the muscles. So, um, your muscles will cope a bit better. Your knees won't hurt, hurt won't hurt as much typically. Yeah, definitely take advantages of the rest stops. One thing that I have found for myself and for a lot of clients is, is that if you do stop for too long, though, your body can kind of cool down and then it's like, oh, I'm going to get going again. So it's good, like, you know, over, over the sort of the day, it's fine to stop and have a bit of a longer stop for lunch. But generally, as a rule, you, you don't want to be stopping for, like, you know, too long. Okay? Using some recovery techniques. Um, can be really helpful so um, the typical ones that I find foam roller is fabulous not everyone has one um, you can certainly if you've got a Nalgene bottle you can use that as a foam roller um, the traditional uh, good old rolling pins are a little bit too small but you can actually roll those across your quads muscles and your calves if you like um, and some of the little um, little massage balls are great as well I mean if you can just you know, even spend 10 minutes, um, you know, using a massage gun is fabulous. The other thing is also obviously, you know, eat something, you know, have something to eat sort of shortly after the event, um, make sure that you're replacing all, all that, you know, fuel that you've lost in your body, um, drink enough because usually you can't re replace enough water over the course of the day. It's really important to drink. Um, and, you know, for um, many people having like either, as much as I don't love it, having an ice bath or a warm bath, either or, and then just, you know, that evening, um, you know, a little bit of gentle stretching or whatever. Um, and if you're not doing the event the next day, get out and just go for a cruisy walk or just, um, you know, some stuff in the garden or an easy bike ride. Just don't completely plan to lay on the couch and not move because 
then all the lactic acid builds up, your body stiffens up and you'll probably be more sore. So just definitely plan to do something a little bit cruisy. One of the other things that you can do um, that's often helpful is, is just considering wearing compression tights. If you happen to have them, look, they're not for everyone. I personally don't tend to use them much. Um, I'm a bit of a subscriber to the old foam roller and the massage gun and the the um, the massage ball. So if you can if you can stick around exactly as you said and use those, that's the that's what I would tend to suggest, which is great. And then um, you can do that. Obviously, if you have one at home the next day, if you're not doing the next day event, or obviously after your for a couple of days after the event. Um, and most of all, just really enjoy the event and take the opportunity to do the training because. The training is, as I said, that's where the magic happens. It's it's where you bond with your teammates. It's it's where you create those habits that you get into the walking and you can really make a difference to your health and to your life. So um, enjoy the whole process and, and have a great time. Fingers crossed for no rain. <laughs> a little tiny drizzle is okay. <laughs> a little bit drizzle is fine. <laughs> Well, thank you, Ro. You're an absolute wealth of information. So for more tips, um, Ro has the most amazing Instagram where you are really good at producing your content and making it little bite-sized bits of information. So jump onto Instagram at thehikingphysio.au. Are you also on Facebook? Yeah, I'm also on Facebook and there is actually a Facebook group. Um, so same same thing. It's at the hiking it's at the hikingphysio.au. So if you type in the hiking physio, you'll probably find me. Um and you know, also check out the website, check out my website, um the, the, the hiking physio www.thehikingphysio.au. There are a few blog articles there um and if you want to get in contact with me um certainly do use the contact form on the website um at the moment most of my appointments are set on tuesday afternoons but honestly um i the one of the great things about online care is it's incredibly flexible so if you want to chat to me you just uh text me or message me a few times that you can do and um i'm happy to open up some well, times for you great off your hike, so <laughs> They know that you've said that. Um, but yeah, all your info, all your details are also in the participant info guide and on the training dashboard. Um, and we'll pop everything up on the screen here. So there should be no excuses. Worst case, send um, us an email at Great Aussie Hike um, <laughs> and we'll, we'll put you in touch. But thank you so much for your time, Ro, and for providing such great advice 